Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Saturn is one of the jewels of the solar system. It's many people's favorite planet because of its very beautiful rings. And so there's a lot of space art, art which is basically there to tell you about you know, discoveries, about uh, potential missions to other planets, to give you ideas about what the future of exploration may hold. You might think that there is some future where there will be humans standing on a moon off Saturn and they will be able to look out onto these grand rings and experience them with their own eyes. And sure, if you're not quite that patient, you can wait for NASA missions which are going to go to Titan. Very specifically, the Dragonfly mission will go there and maybe it will peek at Saturn through the clouds. There are video games that use the, the rings prominently in their art design. This is Call of Duty Infinite Warfare, my favourite Call of Duty. Here's the thing, none of these views are realistic. The grandeur of Saturn's rings, as viewed from Saturn's moons, is somewhat diminished by the fact that basically all of the close-in moons orbit exactly in the same plane as the rings. You have to go a long way out of the plane before you start to see these beautiful rings for uh, what they truly are. Mimas is the innermost large moon. It has a radius of about 400 kilometers and it famously has a crater which makes it look suspiciously like the Death Star. It actually gives you a pretty amazing view of the rings. It's only one and a half degrees out of uh, the ring plane but it's close enough in that those rings are going to take a fairly substantial chunk of the sky. Mimas is 185,000 kilometers from Saturn and Saturn's 120,000 kilometers across. So it works out to be about 60 to 70 times the diameter of the moon or the sun in the Earth's sky. So this is a monster object that we would see. But as we go out and we follow the larger moons, we get Enceladus, uh, Tethys, Dione, Rhea, Titan, they all have inclinations which are very small, a fraction of a degree. And in many cases, these will be viewing the ring system edge on and there will be no, no ability to discern any real detail in these rings. Of course, you can have a lot of interior moons to look at. That will still make it a very pretty flight. But yeah, you don't, you're not seeing these uh, amazing high inclination ring views that you see in this concept art. You have to go all the way out to Iapetus to find an object which is, you know, collapsed into a sphere under its own gravity and has an inclination that is significant. Iapetus has an inclination of about 15 degrees, which means you can see both above and below those rings during, a, you know, an orbital cycle. And even at this distance, Saturn would remain a formidable sight in the sky. Its angular diameter would be about, uh, you know, almost two degrees. So it would be uh, about three and a half times the diameter of the sun or the, the moon as we see it from Earth. And as it happens, how we see Saturn from Earth probably informs a lot of this space art. Now, Saturn is inclined by about 27 degrees to the ecliptic, so we get the whole range of Saturn's rings, but we have to view it obviously from afar. From Saturn's point of view, you can see how the illumination on the planet changes as it orbits the sun, and that's pretty much a proxy for the angle at which you would see it from Earth, since the Earth is much, much closer to the sun than it is to Saturn. At the highest aspect angle, you can see that the shadow of Saturn actually is inside the edge of the rings. And it's also important to note that the plane of rotation of the rings exactly matches the plane of rotation of the planet, you know, where the pole is. And if you think about it for a second, that's kind of mind-blowing because the rings aren't solid objects. They're made of tiny thousands of small chunks of ice and dirt that are all following their own orbits, and yet they have all decided to fall into the same very thin plane. And I'm pretty sure the main driver, the main force driving this self-organization is the oblateness of Saturn. So we're going to turn on the grid here. You can see that Saturn's rotation is inclined to this uh, imaginary grid. Now, what we're going to do is take Saturn and adjust its obliquity of its poles so that it is aligned to the plane. And that leaves the rings no longer aligned with Saturn. 
Finally, we're going to turn on non-spherical gravity. This is in, in Universe Sandbox. So non-spherical gravity basically simulates the oblateness of this planet. As the planet rotates, the centrifugal force, as you say, tends to stretch it out along its equatorial plane and make it a little fatter around the middle. This happens on Earth. We call it fat Earth theory. And this extra mass around the middle tends to cause orbits that are inclined close in to precess around. Now, the closer the orbits are, the faster they precess. So you see that by turning this on, we've taken this nice, flat, perfectly organized ring. And now, depending upon the particle altitude, they are twisting around the planet at different rates. So yeah, if the rotation of the rings aren't linked up with the rotation of the planet, you're going to get this big mess rather than these rare, you know, nice, thin, beautiful rings. Now, if we zoom in close and we actually watch the particles moving in front of the planet, you'll notice that there's a group that are going down and there's a group of objects that are going up. Now, if you think about it, these things might potentially collide head on. Right? There's going to be some sort of interactions. Obviously, this simulation isn't working at that resolution. So I'm asking you to imagine that slowly over millions of years, these particles will have a chance of colliding each other. And as they collide, they will tend to cancel out their vertical rates and eventually all settle into the same plane into a nice set of rings, into a disk. And this is, of course, analogous to the kind of uh, drag collision that you get inside a planetary, a protoplanetary disk as basically the sun forms. And then as each of the planets form inside the sun's protoplanetary disk, they form their own like planetary disks, which form the planet plus their moons, which is why, of course, all the moons of planets tend to be aligned in a disk, which tends to be aligned with the planet itself. OK, I mean, we're talking a pretty small sample size here, to be honest, but, you know, it works for Jupiter, it works for Saturn, it even works for Uranus, and Uranus has a huge uh, inclination with the rest of the ecliptic. Now, to be clear, this really only applies to the large moons which are close in. There are many other moons which are further out that have much less constraints placed on their uh, orbits, mostly because they were captured probably at some point later. Iapetus also, it probably had its orbit kicked up by an encounter with a larger body at some point. And indeed, a collision with a between a moon and a large enough body to change its orbital inclination would generate a dust cloud and that dust cloud would slowly settle and because of the reasons I've outlined it would ultimately form into a flat ring system more or less aligned with the parent body. Of course, a giant collision like that would cause a lot of impacts on other bodies. More likely, uh, you know, you could form a ring by a, pl a moon falling in too low and starting to experience, uh, you know, the tidal effects of the parent body, tearing them apart into smaller and smaller pieces. But these pieces still being kept close to the surface or close to the parent body and forming a ring. Now, our best estimates for when that might have happened are based on measurements the Cassini spacecraft took during its final months in orbit. It was actually orbiting underneath the rings. It would go out to a very long distance and then fall in and pass inside the rings. And by doing very precise radio measurements, right, you can measure the change in velocity as the spacecraft moves through this orbit. They could measure the difference between the acceleration inside the rings and outside the rings. And so they could get uh, a measurement of the mass. And it's something like 15 billion billion kilograms. OK, that doesn't make much sense to you. It's about one five thousandth of the mass of the moon. Or let's put it in Saturn's terms. It's about 40% of the mass of Mimas, which is, of course, the innermost spherical moon of Saturn. And so from this, they can begin to estimate the ages of the rings by looking at the albedo. So the rings are very, very bright. The particles that make them up are way more reflective than the particles that make up, say, asteroids like Bennu. So if the rings are of a certain mass, they have a certain surface area based on their size distribution. So you can estimate how much uh, dust from interplanetary sources is coming in and coating these surfaces. And so by measure, estimating the rate at which that happens, you can say the rings must be in the range 10 million to 100 million years old. Otherwise, they would be way darker from all the interplanetary dust falling and making the rings look dirty and boring and grey.
So yeah, rewinding 100 million years ago, Saturn may not have any rings at all, or they may be a lot less impressive. And then, of course, something catastrophic happens, and they became vastly more impressive. And while I'm sure it would be impressive, you still would be looking at it edge on from most of the major moons of Saturn. And visions like this are really not just the work of science fiction, but the work of imagination. You wouldn't be able to see these views unless you were able to move the moons of Saturn by a significant amount. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.